You're listening to Raising Anchor, a Rhode Island FC podcast. We're glad you're here. Hello, and welcome to Raising Anchor, your podcast and source for all things Rhode Island FC. I'm your host, Matt Entrican, and joining me today is the Pawtucket Mayor, Donald Grebian. Mayor Grebian, how are you doing? Matt, great to be here. I'm all good. Um, looking forward to uh, our opening season, which is this year, but looking forward to the Rhode Island FC club uh, kicking the ball this year. I'm so well, glad. Next year, sorry. <laughs> I'm so glad you say that because uh, I think one of the most important things in getting a chance to sit down and talk with you today is there's been a lot of conversation on the back end about the stadium development, about the team structure and organization and the role you've played in helping bring that across the finish line. And it's only fitting that we finally get to hear from the city side and and the tremendous support that's been given um, with your administration on what that role has been so far. But before we get to all that, I think it's important because not everyone listening to this is a citizen of Pawtucket. Some may even be outside of the state. You mean but, there's something outside of Pawtucket? I mean, <laughs> I don't, I don't want to start an interstate, you know, conflict. But, but I think it would be important for those that maybe aren't accustomed or aware of who you are as a person, if maybe you could share some of your backstory. So, in my research, I, I am not a citizen of Pawtucket. I will, I will uh, say full disclosure. In, in the interview's over. <laughs> no, God, that's don't hold that against me. But um, in in my research, you know, I, I did find that your rise to office has been astonishing you know you started as an elected official in 2010 and from what i've learned from the city it wasn't doing so hot at that time and you and your administration have been able to you know take that on your shoulder and you're now in a third term and we've seen nothing but you know great things coming from the city of Pawtucket so i think if you could share in your own words how would you describe the city's transformation under your stewardship um, you know, I hope that, and I help self. I hate self reflecting because uh, it's not about me. It's really about the community. Um, you know, we came from when I started in, in history. I born and raised here, Matt. Um, served on the city council. Um, I've learned my lessons. You know, the old way: when you get knocked down, you keep coming back up. So, my first time I ran for council, I got the you know the heck kicked out of me, um, and but kept persistent. Worked was elected um, in the council. Stayed on the council for eleven years. Had one term of. Uh, leadership position as the um, council president. And as I said, you get knocked down, you come back up. In um, 2008, um, I ran for mayor. Uh, Lost, came very close, but lost in 2010. We used to say again in 10 was the slogan. Uh, And we were successful, and I've been here since 2011 serving and had the pleasure. So I'm in my 13th year. Um, You know, when we first started 13 years ago, um, we were under the state, uh, potential state takeover. Um, We were just talking about uh, finances where we might have been out three or four months, you know, holding bills and trying to pay to survive. And so it was challenging. And, you know, as you look back in the first four years, we just had to, you know, I say slender down uh, um, government. You know, working for the people, I think, with my past business experience, I brought something to the table. So I've been very fortunate. Um, but it's not me. It's you're smart enough to put the good people around you. Just as we talk about Rhode Island FC, it's going to be a team effort. Um, you know, I played sports at a very young age. I was never that athletic. You can tell by the size of me. Well, they can't. But um, but you know, I'm big and big, too big to be playing some sports. But but understood the teamwork and you needed valuable people around you. So I've been fortunate to have some the right people at the right times. Um, we've pushed the city forward. You know, uh, from our bond rating, which was close to junk, to a triple A rating, you know, finances, we had no reserves. We probably have about $12 million in reserves. And, you know, we still have our challenges, don't get me wrong. And, and the balance is, right? It's easy in government. I can go out and just raise taxes, and nobody wants to raise taxes. Not my job, right? To fill it. So you do those balances. So we've been very, very fortunate, I think, as a community in the transition. And, you know, sometimes it takes longer than you really want it to, and very, very frustrating government. And then, you know, we've, we've had our challenges. We've, um, you know, we've had where we lost the Paw Sox, but at the end, as we sit here, we're going to be better off um, with the Rhode Island FC, and we'll talk a little more about that. I get that. But so there's always that bright light, and it's, you know, it's at the end result. And, again, people here in Pawtucket, um, we're very culturally diverse. Um, we have a high population of Cape Verdean, a high population of um, Colombian, and, and Irish and Polish, and we're, we're a melting pot. And... Um, People are resilient. They care about the community. We all have that 
in common, and we want to see um, how things grow and develop. So been very fortunate to get back on track. I mean, to get off a little bit there as, as politicians do. But, but I'm really uh, happy about the progression the city's made. A um, lot more to do. You know, it, it takes way too long. But, I, you know, we do see the, the um, positive movement, and I think people are excited about that and with the new things that are happening. So, Is there an accomplishment, like something that is above all others when you think back on your tenure so far? You know, you, you always go back, and, and as uh, Tip O'Neill, you say, all politics is local. And it really is about providing the services, um, providing better services at a lower cost. Um, you know, over the years, we've done some of the things where we have we've privatized our, re- our trash and recycling because of pricing and equipment. And it was hard because you now have people that were hardworking, um, that were afraid to lose their jobs. And so you balance that. And, and, I, and we didn't lose any jobs. And I share that with you only because the quality of life issues matter, right? So how the streets are cleaned, we've, uh, how the streets are um, upkept. We've resurfaced 85, 90% of our roads. We've repaved uh, through some bonding programs. That's why the bonds is, your bond rating is so important. Um, you know, big schools, we're a big, big uh, picture items. We have our schools. Um, you know, we in the last, collectively, this is not just me, it's me, members of the city council, members of the school committee, and all our teams and our staff and the residents who have to support it. Um, that's why I talk about the team. But at the end of the day, we've invested, we've uh, renovated um, three, uh, two schools have been renovated. Um, we built a brand new one, winter school from ground up came down. Um, we're moving forward with uh, Unified High School. Um, one of the small schools will be open, uh, again, ground up, um, starting, I think it's this September. No, it's next September, I think, right? The 2025 season, the Baldwin. So we're investing. And unfortunately, you know, again, you're trying to balance all your expenses and your revenue from the, you know, the, um, uh, the residents because you don't want to burden them. But I think the bigger things are, you know, the quality of life matters. And I think how we focus in on that, that's how you get reelected or you build relationships. You know, if somebody's trash isn't picked up, that's a major issue or an inconvenience. But the big picture items is we now have commuter rail. We're investing in our schools. Um, you know, we're going to have our waterfront public access opened up to tie into the development of the stadium and all the other development. And people are investing. And that's what's exciting about it. These are exciting times. Um, you know, again, but when we're doing those things, we still have challenges and things that we face on a regular basis. I hear that loud and clear, and, and I don't think there isn't a single city within the state that doesn't face those challenges. You seem just to be doing it a little bit better than the rest. I, I won't throw shade on where I live at the moment because my mayor wouldn't appreciate that. I love him, though. Um, having said all that, though, jumping into the soccer aspect, I think you mentioned a second ago that, you know, you played, uh, at, you were an athlete as a, as a no, young I, man. I, I, was, I, young tried man. To be, I tried to be an athlete. I never was. All <laughs> okay. right? but, but I played enough to understand how important teamwork was. Okay. You know? What was your sport when you were playing? So actually, you know, I, you know, I kid with my father. My father passed away. And, but my father was the, the sports guy. You know, he graduated from Shea, which was uh, uh, West High School back then. And I laughed. So he was a basketball player, football player, awards, recognitions. So in some ways, I disappointed him because I wasn't the athlete. Uh, but I played baseball, you know, locally, the minor leagues and the little leagues. Uh, football, soccer, and I know people are going to resent me for saying this, but as I'm growing up, I say I'm 56, soccer wasn't a real sport when I was a kid. That's how people thought about it, even though it was. It wasn't here. So it was mostly baseball, football. Um, again, I was too um, non-coordinated to be on ice skates, so I never played <laughs> hockey. <laughs> I, you know, I, I, I don't think that your story is that unique in the sense that there are a lot of Americans that are gravitating slowly into the sport as a whole. I myself was not a soccer fan as a younger person. I didn't get into it until a college study, you know, abroad where I was like, what is this phenomenal thing? So I totally hear you loud and clear. And I think your story resonates with a lot of people. It certainly resonates with a lot of citizens in Pawtucket, which we'll talk about in a bit. Having said that, though, so are you now officially a fan of soccer with all of the investment, or uh, so, is that to come? Oh, with... absolutely no. I mean, I'm going to learn. So where I learned soccer, or summer soccer, right, and I still get confused because, uh, you know, the penalties, and I forget when I haven't been there. But really where I enjoyed it the most is both my uh, daughter, who is 24, and, they played the, and my son, Connor, who's 22, they played the youth sports. And they played soccer and enjoyed it. And what I enjoyed the most about it is, 
it's more of a family sport. Everybody's engaged, you're doing all these tournaments, you're building relationships with family, you're traveling because it's not just here on a local level. So I really enjoyed that and wished I played. So now the problem is my, my children didn't carry that on, so I gotta go back and re- learn all the rules again <laughs> and go through you know the red card. We'll, we'll, teach, we'll <laughs> teach you how that all works. But I will say it's refreshing to hear that because I've heard things be shared in you know some of the social media channels that your 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 investment in this soccer strategy is because it came from some irrational fandom. So almost hearing that this was strictly a logistical, sensical, and strategic decision to to introduce to the city and the community. I love that narrative more yep. because it's not like you were like, I I saw a game, I love it so much, we have to bring soccer here no matter what happens next. I, I think that, and if I can, and and I think that. You know, listen, we, we have a history with the Pawtucket Red Sox, the Paw Sox. We know we lost them. You know, they were beloved here. And so baseball, and, you know, there was, there was a family sport, um, you know, family oriented. They tried to keep their prices down just as the Rhode Island soccer or football club, I should say, will be doing. Um, you know, I, but baseball, as much as I enjoyed it and was my, is on its way out. There are challenges. I shouldn't say out because I don't know that baseball ever will be a go, but they, you know, they're, they're trying to make it a faster sport. People have changed. So you know all of those things. So when we lost them, you know, we were trying to fill a hole. And at that time, um, Governor Raimondo and Secretary Pryor worked, uh, Commerce Secretary worked with the City of Pawtucket Council. We did an RFP um, to replace the Paw Sox, if you will. And, you know, we wanted to development because the Paw Sox led us to the waterfront and thinking about our waterfront differently. And how we could do uh, at the time, you know, sports. But it was really about the development and the activity that came. So we went out, we do the governmental process, and in comes uh, Brett Johnson and his group from Phoenix um, as one of the bidders. We had a couple other bidders, and there were some interesting proposals. But soccer is an up-and-coming sport, right? With the diverse community we have, the cultures we have. I was just down in, uh, I'm fortunate to be on a mission with a health organization last week in Cape Verde. And so uh, we were supposed to go to the game, but then we didn't get tickets. But uh, but it was just a, like it, there's a lot of energy and excitement around that. So it's up and coming, you know. And I say it's still growing. It's not a uh, – and, again, I love baseball, so I don't mean to diminish it. It's not on the decline. So they came in, and we're excited. We now had, you know, something to fill that void as we lost. And in some ways, a much better. And then, and then Brenton folks who are at the beginning of their career were excited about this. They invested in Pawtucket, and it took a lot. Um, and then we saw an opportunity on our waterfront uh, to really open it up. So that's exciting. So at the end of the day, there's no, uh, you know, a history of me being a soccer fan, right? It really is. It came in, and I do believe, as much as I wish the, you know, the Usox the best and the folks, um, I do think that as we sit here today, this is a much better opportunity. You know, people get nervous when you say better deal, but better investment for the city of Pawtucket in the long run. So. That's what I'm excited about. No, I agree. And there are statistics that show baseball's continued year-over-year decline um, in both viewership and match attendance, especially the way structure of baseball is. It's so many games that I don't know if maybe people have the attention span in today's world. Uh, <laughs> and soccer on the opposite side is, again, because it came from from nothing, right, as, a, as an attention grabber. It, it's, it's almost like the numbers are inverted, where you see soccer rise year-over-year year at the same percentage that baseball is declining. So... Again, tip yeah. of the cap for, for, for understanding kind of the future of sport and within the state and within the city. Um, I think if we can go back, though, and just address this part, too, because a lot of what I want to make sure you get a chance to, to advocate for on today's episode is an understanding that there is concern and worry from the citizenry, yeah. um, both inside Pawtucket itself and Rhode Island. And, you know, when I was doing my research for what are the comparisons you know, the Paw Sox is definitely a part of that. And, and I think there's a question I'd like to ask in a little bit. But the one that was really interesting came from the 38 Studio concept. And I know how how bad that kind of ended as a result for the state. As, an, as a community, we, we seem to not be able to get away from that. It, it's one thing to understand and remember and be cautious, but it's almost like that continues to haunt large-scale investments within the state. Very good point. What do you say to people that are hesitant to not only accept that we are putting another professional sport in Rhode Island, in Pawtucket, but that we need to shake those those binds that exist from those kinds of examples. So first, you know, I, I want to give a lot of credit to to Brett Johnson and the the team and the organization because 
Um, everything that they've been put through, just like the Paw Sox were, because of the scrutiny, and I'll, I'll get to the 38 studios, and we, we haven't got over that, and I don't think people will, right? And so, um, but with Brett, like, they put up with a lot. They're still here. They're true investors, um, and they've stuck it out where others might not have because of that perception issue. The other one I give a lot of credit to is, is honestly, uh, Governor McKee. Like, Governor McKee, you know, politically, there was sometimes... It's the loudest voices, but not necessarily the overwhelming population. And, and that's where we all are. People are out there on social media. And, and, you know, he really, him and his team, they, with us, we all, you know, the council is invested in this, um, the administration. But we all did our due diligence. And we understood. Everybody understood the, the scrutiny, for lack of a better term, we're under because of 38 Studios. That was a bad deal, right? It was horrible the way it didn't protect anybody. And then we went from that loss and we overreacted that we didn't want to do anything. And so that's where the poor size come in, where the value and that they had established in the community and in Rhode Island, people were afraid to invest because they were just saying, oh, this is like 38 studios. And the loudest voices, uh, which is sometimes the minority, but they were loud. Um, and so, you know, it pushed the, the government, the General Assembly to do things that you know, they didn't have the courage to do at the time. I give, they've supported us now and they're here now. So I think that it's still difficult. That climate is still here no matter how much because you still hear it. Well, you know, I'm sure you got some other questions on it. But at the end of the day, I think this is going to be the great experience. Um, and when I say that, it's not now because there's still negative stories coming out. And, you know, people, we like as much as we say, oh, I don't want to read about it. We all read about it. It's like the National Enquirer when, we're, when I was a kid, right? And so, so it's, it's, it's tasty, right? And so, but in all honesty, there's really nothing here. And this investment for the city of Pawtucket, I mean, think about it. It's over $100 million of private investment coming in just in a stadium, as they say it, right? It's more than a stadium. Um, you know, yes, the city and the uh, state have put in minimal amounts and I can't change people's mind if they don't want government I investing in a business, but we have to because to be competitive. And then if you can look beyond just the soccer stadium or a sports team, as everybody gets, I think the challenge, Matt, has been like, it was 38 Studios, which was Kurt Schilling, which was baseball, right? Even though it was a video game company, it was still, then it was a Paw Sox. Oh, right. Direct line, baseball, sports, right? Oh, soccer, sports, right? So that I think people in time will get over. And I really believe that they'll get over this when they see the product that comes out of this and the development for the waterfront. You know, they, everybody focuses, though I say the naysayers, and they focus in on, oh, the investment is just a stadium. No, it's not. We're having public access for the first time on our riverfront, of our underutilized riverfront. Let's just talk on the Taft Street side, where the stadium's going to be. There are going to be restaurants. It's going to be an active zone. Um, and I'm excited about that. You're going to have people coming in to sit and watch games. And then they're going to, you know, they're going to spur out. Let, let, you know, there's calculations on what the, the spillover will be into the restaurants, into the community. But just around that area... You know, we're going to be putting a bridge as phase uh, 1B. You know, after the stadium's done, you know, it, we'll put this uh, bridge to connect to the other side. There's going to be, again, it, when we say this today, the market drives it. But it's going to be retail, commercial, residential. I mean, before COVID, we were talking about bringing in, trying to bring in, um, you know, corporations that had 500 people in an office, right? Nobody wants to be in an office anymore. Like, nobody expected that. So... I'm careful to say it, but there's so much opportunity coming with that. So, um, you know, we, we definitely are getting um, a, a value partner here. Again, I, I want to say this. I give them a lot of credit because they, uh, you know, they have serious dollars invested. Um, you know, so I don't know if they could have walked away. But, you know, sometimes the way everybody's been treated is you're getting, you know, put it through the ringer when you really don't need to. So to your point, it's very hard. I don't, I think after this project is seen and it's successful, as we all know it will be, um, you know, you kind of say to the naysayers, I told you so. But until we prove that, and even then, you're still going to have a percentage out there saying it's still not the right thing. But this is, Pawtucket as a whole is, is invested in this. You know, the council as a whole is invested in this. Don't get me wrong. We, we all involve politics. You hear a story, you hear a rumor, we want to understand it. 
But at the end of the day, this is right for the community, and it's more than just soccer. It's a development opportunity. So, Speaking of, of stories, uh, there's been several over the last few weeks that have come out uh, drawing attention on the cost of the stadium project. And I just wanted to make sure your office got to say and dispel any concerns or um, scares that there isn't an additional amount of public funded dollars going that has not already been committed. There's there's no additional attachments from the citizens, from from the from your office itself, or from the state for that matter. Agreed. So so you know, and and I'm going to use the the rough numbers, but so you the stadium grew uh, from about a hundred million dollar project or 110 I and, and I'm not trying to ev- I'm just trying to go off the top of my head to about 140 to 50 million dollars okay and I can even I can help you out. so it started at 81 covid yep. costs brought it to 120 plus yep. and now the new numbers are 137 137 right. so so in that there was conversations there was vetting process the commerce board there were votes that that really didn't put any additional money into the pot it shifted it from phase B of the plan to phase one and the governor. So the $27 million that was invested, there's some money coming from an island rebuild that's public record. I just don't remember the exact now. And and the city is committed to $10 million. So nothing has changed. In fact, the increases that have happened over the last several months be, are really being all borne by the private investor. It's on them. So the state has about close to 40 million-ish number invested in it. Um, and the city will be putting 10 million. What we found to be better is rather than borrow because the market rate went up is we were able to use some of our federal dollars into that. So instead of borrowing the money and having to pay the interest, we're, bu- we're using the federal dollars to put into the stadium. And then there's a payment structure from the league as into the tax stabilization that's going to pay that back over the 20 years. So, so to clear that up, right, there's a lot of misinformation out there. There's a lot of exaggeration, um, you know. Media outlets go for the the glory sometimes, and while they might not be totally lying, they are definitely not telling the full truth. Uh, you know, there was an article about um, the investment going up seventy percent, right? Well, that's true, right? That the, the num- that's a fact, but not in the story that was it told that the fortuitous development of the Taiwan is absorbing all of that. Um, I find it challenging, and and so this is what happens, and people say. Why don't you tell me this? Or how come you're not talking about that? Well, right now is a very delicate time for the city and really for the for the bond sales is we're out selling bonds right now. And the last thing anybody wants to do is negatively influence the impact. Um, the bonds are going to protect the city. I'm sorry, not the city, the state. Uh, you know, And I think what people get confused on is the PRA, which is our Pawtucket Redevelopment Agency. And if I'm talking too much, Matt, shut me down. <laughs> but the PRA is the... Um, the mechanism to borrow the state dollars. And then there are extra protections in there that we're paying more money for, for bond issuance, bond protection, because the bondholders are taking the risk and the responsibility. So it won't happen, but if it went belly up, right, because of like we use the 30 state studio analogy, there is money that we're paying more up front that the bondholders will get that risk so the state doesn't. But there's a cost to that, right? And then, so it sounds sexy, right? But there is truly a cost to that. But I digress a little bit. The numbers that are out there are the true numbers. Um, there's no additional money that's been put in that hasn't been um, put, you know, explained in, in transparent process. Um, so all of that stuff, you know, I, while it sells maybe papers and, you know, media uh, um, advantages, it, it, it's not the case in this thing. And can I say one other thing? So, of course. And I think just as the elected official, and I just thought about this, is I know people are never going to believe this, but it took us a lot of time because we needed to make sure that we protected people's dollars because you know, that's the last thing anybody wants. There's probably an overprotection in some ways and this cost that comes with that. But at the end of the day, it was a due diligent process. Everything is out public. And if there are certain things that are not out in a public way, they will be at the right time. So this will be a very transparent process. So, No, agreed. And, you know, I think it's important that people understand from what we've learned in talking with the community that there's a lot of attention on the stadium itself. But like you said, with the phase one or phase A and then phase B, there's so much more really going into this this river front work and in the, in the Tidewater Landing project. It's not just the stadium. And when we talk to people about it, they're so 
gravitated that towards that first step, yeah. right? Yeah. Yep. So in that experience for yourself as the mayor, what do you tell citizens about all of those other things? You mentioned the retail footprint, you mentioned the dining options, but from what I've seen from the RFP and from the additional plans, there's extensive pieces. Like we really haven't touched base on the housing part yet. There's the there's the planned event center or coordinated community space. What what can you tell citizens uh, in anticipation of hearing more concrete timelines and like the development of that? Because once we get to the soccer, the work's not done, right? Right, right. So so you know we hopefully by the end of this year will have all the bonds uh, sold and we'll have everything finalized. So there'll be no more questions about on the stadium, right? We're, we're investing the money. There should be no questions, but everything will be finalized and everything will be laid out public. Now what it takes is phase 1B, and to your point, there's a lot more of what really is. There was an event center proposed. The markets might change some of that. There's housing. We have a crisis here in the state of Rhode Island. There's, um, you know, we're looking to do a medium and, and affordable housing here. So there are pieces that we need to start looking at, but it's the same folks, right? And this is what people forget. It's the, and I don't mean this in a bad way, it's this development group that have their team. It's the state that has their team and the city has their team. And the state of city, and I'm not going to apply, I don't mean, a, I was going to say a very slim and, and, and short staffed in a lot of ways. And I don't mean to imply the developer isn't, right? But we're working together. So we only have so much bandwidth. So once this is done, now we'll go to phase two on that project, which is the other side of the river. We already have dollars in place from federal uh, grants for the bridge that help us, for dollars on the bridge, for public access, for the roadway and the infrastructure work. So we've been doing all those pieces that people don't really see, and they won't see until you know the ground is being you know leveled. But to go beyond that, we have, as Pawtucket folks will know, we have our apex building, right? The city you know paid, um, purchased that property. We see that as waterfront access. We should be out in January, February with uh, an RFQ on what we'd like to see in that property. What's an RFQ? Sorry, so it's a request for qualifications. So everything, there's a request for proposal. And normally what the city does, and this is what our government does, is we'll throw something on the table, say this is what we'd like to see, and come in and bid on it. Because everything has to be bid on. So we see all of that property from the apex um, it's about a 10-acre site, including the Apex Tire Center, some of the other properties that we now own. We see that as another development opportunity that really enhances the Tidewater for, uh, development. But not as a part of Fortuitous Partners? Nope, nope. Right now, they're separate and apart. So Fortuitous has the, um, uh, what's the one I'm looking for? The, the control. South side of the bridge. Yes, yeah, so they have both, the south side of the bridge, but they have both sides of the river is under theirs, and I think they have a five-year. I don't want to agreement with the city to do the development and we'll hold them accountable as the council will and um, you know we actually it was originally five and because we got delayed the year because of these bonds went back to the council and the council gave them an addition not additional five f- starting point they we, reset, yeah, the, clock. reset yeah. the clock so so that's all on them and they have the responsibilities and we need to talk about what phase two is we have they have ideas right it's going to be funding what what drives the the revenue into that district but the Apex site is really on the city. So we're going to be going out for uh, design. We brought an engineer, an architect in, and a um, consultant to do the design work. They'll be out in the community. What does the community want to see? Is it a housing, all housing? Is it a mixed use? What complements not only the stadium, what complements and now finally gets us the traffic that we need in our downtown to support our businesses? Um, what is, how does it complement to the commuter rail site, the TOD that we have? And, you know, we, downtown is struggling because of the one ways it has well before my time and when retail, you know, when the, the malls took over and now the malls are no longer, right? right? Yeah. Um, so the, we've, and this is what people don't know, and, and we need to do a better job telling, it's easy to say, it, but we've already got grants for safe streets. We've applied for grants. So we're looking to connect the whole downtown with bike paths. Some of it's already out there, but it's not fully designed or fully connected. Walking paths, safer streets for everybody. Um, so if you go from the commuter rail, um, we would be going north down to the Tidewater Apex site to the south side of the uh, of the. Highway. We see that as our economic zone. Now, don't get me wrong. There are a lot of small businesses that we support out in other areas of the community. We have other housing, and we have to focus on that. But this is our new active zone, um, besides our school. You know, we're we're hopeful. Or we we're not hopeful. We know that. 
hopeful five years, potentially six to seven years. Toman High School, which is right across the street from City Hall, um, that's going to become an opportunity for the city for maybe uh, housing, um, other uses, a higher use that brings more revenue into the city long term. So I think there's a lot of opportunity out there. And you're right. There are some other things that we're going to be figuring out. Is there a fixed minimum threshold for the number of housing uh, units that you anticipate Tidewater needs to create? I, I don't know if there's a commitment that's been put together for the city itself. And so, no. I, so there's not commitment. Um, right? We know that we want to focus in on affordable affordability, but we also have to bring in folks that have disposable income. And they, you got to balance it out. We do not want to push anybody out. We want to make sure people are... But you have to balance that out. And so there's no really number. What will happen is phase two is you'll start to look at the the property with them and the land. What can really fit? How many units? And then they'll start doing the market studies. What drives this? What sustains the construction? And, and that's where, um, we didn't talk a little bit about this, where the, the uniqueness of Pawtucket is we have the TIF zone, which is tax incremental financing, which was approved by the General Assembly after we lost the poor stock. So it was too late, but what it did is gave us a tool that all new revenue that comes into this district is put into an account um, separate and apart that is utilized for these investors who come in that we can put into those projects. So when we're talking about the $27 million that the state is putting in for fortuitous into the, you know, into the Tidewater site, um, it's getting going to get paid. The bonds are going to get paid back by the new revenue that comes in. And so there's an argument to be made that if we didn't have this development, we wouldn't be able to bring new revenue in. And then after it's paid off, that revenue will come right, direct to the city. So the reason I say this, there are tools out there that are really going to help us increase the development, increase the uh, community. But there's no number, Matt, really, if it's five units or 105 units. That'll be filtered out um, over the course of the probably the next three to four, three to six months um, after, you know, the bonds are all set at the end of the year. You know, it's interesting you you referenced the Paw Sox again and, and how that continued event has yes. so many tendrils that touch so many other things. Um, there's been a lot of news recently, both from the, the Worcester side of things, as well as some stuff more closer to home. I don't want to touch on all of the things going on recently yeah. with the billionaire development. If you want to say <laughs> something, feel free. Um, but what I, I wanted to ask is, you know, going back to there was such a there was such a loud cry or outcry for saving McCoy and knowing that the city is still moving forward with the intention to, to develop and, and build what looks like a fantastic high school. I'm really excited for that for you guys. Uh, I just find it interesting that you, you continue to hear citizens say, we need to halt sports innovation in this Tidewater Landing project, but then simultaneously save and preserve our sports you know, culture and history there. What do you say to, to people that want it both ways? Um, so that's very difficult, right? Because that's exactly what is happening, right? So a lot of people, and I'm not, Pawtucket was very supportive of the Paw Sox and even more supportive of the uh, Rhode Island Football Club. And they are, right? Just a Pawtucket. So what happens is you start to think about, you, and I don't mean this to hurt anybody's feeling, but sometimes you're talking out of both sides of your mouth to your point. So, okay, how do you do this? Um, you know, listen, so we have a, the billionaire, um, um, Stefan Sol, Soloviv, who come in, some would say late into the game, and that's what's, you know, we're already in phase two of our schools. We're well beyond what we should be thinking about um, uh, changes, but there's a small window that we could do this. So when people are coming in and saying we want to save the stadium, there might be an opportunity, and it's the timeline is thin now. I mean, we've been talking about this since June. The deadline is really at the end of the year, and so I don't think it's realistic, but I'm hopeful because if we could save the stadium, use the stadium for the high school you know, uh, setting, right, and build the school around it, everybody wins. But we've all been clear that it needs to work together. It is not going to be McCoy alone, the stadium alone with no school. It's a school. We would want McCoy if we could, and, you know, to do it. So, but people are saying just save it. Based on what you're saying, there is no outcome where the high school moves to the Apex site or McCoy gets rebuilt grounds up at the Apex site. It, like you're saying, it's a very much all-in-one inclusive on that site. Because I don't think I've heard that yet. Yeah, no. Anyone. So, so from us, from uh, as the elected officials, there is the school is not moving from that site. 
Okay, now, could we reconfigure the design of the school to maybe encompass and include the stadium? That's for the architects, and that's what we've been trying to get them to do, right? And then that stadium gets rehabbed, and, you know, the Solvi group does their commitment and comes in. You know, they've given us numbers, but we're still trying to figure out what that full commitment is. So they come in and they renovate it. That would become the high school stadium, but we'd be, have to build a school around it, okay? So, but I don't know... And this is what's hot because everybody gets lost in it because Rhode Island Department of Ed has a piece in it. State has a piece in it, right? You have a private investor. You have the city. And sometimes it's hard to get everybody, you know, as simple as it is for me. And it's just on the back of an envelope. Can it fit? Are there any DEM restrictions that we can't make it? Yes or no? And that's going to make the decision for us. I mean, we'll have more money. So, yes, it is the school first. And if McCoy can stay as part of it, you know, that is an added benefit. Now, just to jump on one of the things on of when you say at uh, Apex, Apex could become anything, right? If there was a legitimate um, organization, or if that Solovev wanted to, and this is not his interest, he's in, you know, their group is uh, rehabbing facilities because we did talk to him about maybe building a uh, baseball at McCoy, like we had talked about with the before the Paw Sox left. We'd entertain that. We we haven't closed that. Because, but the only reason we're shrugging or hesitating on the renovation is because our voters voted $330 million bond to approve a school, a unified high school on that site. If, and we, we've shared these conversations, the school committee, the council, if there was other space and we had an abundance of space and we could shift, you know, the school, we need no less than 10 acres for the school. We don't have that in the city of Pawtucket. So, and a priority is on the education, on the rehab of the buildings. So, it's all inclusive on McCoy, uh, you know, on the McCoy site. But if somebody came in and said, "Hey, I'd like to use the Apex site, and I'd love to build a hotel and a baseball for you, uh, baseball," if the numbers are right and it makes sense for the community, I'd love to be the sports mecca. <laughs> it would be a, it would be a great jewel in the crown of Pawtucket, especially for the state. Yeah, I agree. And and you know, it's interesting too is with all the work that you may or may not do in this space, there's no professional team coming back. With, with a stadium redevelopment or rehab, right? So I think people magically may associate that if you build it, they will the come. Paw Sox are going to match. I mean, know, the Paw so- I mean, unless the, I mean, the Paw Sox are up, the Woo Sox, sorry, are up for sale. Uh, unless the new owners want to come back here, I don't know what their conditions are. It wouldn't be. It, it would, it could be. And, and there's, you know, I don't know enough, but I've learned some during uh, the rules and regulation on a single A, double A team. Sure. You might even be able to get a, because the rules have changed a lot since we were talking about the Paw Sox. Again, we uh, we could maybe get a triple A. Um, we could do an independent league, all right? Do the uh, the Savannah Bananas. Bananas, right? So, But at the end of the day, right, it's got to make sense. Um, and, we, you know, we appreciate the solo view saying, hey, listen, I'm willing to spend $40 million on the stadium, but what are the uses? You know, what's the outcome? So, Right. And, again, yeah. this is a soccer-specific podcast, so we – we don't want to go too deep in the, no, the back of the baseball. Pot sucks. Back on Rhode Island FC. <laughs> um, and in that vein, though, I think you know it was your um, it was your administration that that dealt with the transition of the Paw Sox out. You're now dealing with the transition of the Rhode Island FC organization in. How would you describe the relationship with RIFC so far? Is there an apples to oranges comparison there, or or what what's what's different? What's exciting? So you know, I've said this, and all due respect to because I've I built a very good relationship with Larry Lucchino, Charles Steinberg, and, and I have a, a love for Mike Tamboro, who's been here. Awesome person, right? Um, but they were at a different point, and I'm going to say this respectfully, and I have said this out there, so I don't mean this in any disparaging way, right? Brett and the organization are young, hungry, and new. So they have more of a drive to be successful, Right. Larry's vision was just a stadium. It really wasn't a lot of development. We, we had to pull that development, you know, out of them. Well, the state did, right, because the development was going to pay for the infrastructure type things that we're talking about. So there's that difference of night and day, and I don't think, I think it's part the sport, and I think it's part where they are in the career. And and it's proven, and again, the the Usox are up for sale, and so, you know, that I think was their outcome. They needed a stadium, right, to sell. Right, this here we've protected. We know that we're going to have a stadium, um, so we've done all the right things. So when you say compare, and again, I hate to be don't sound like I'm discriminating age, but it was the energy versus you know 
I guess the best way to say it, the political, some were on the back nine of the game, others were on the front nine of the game. <laughs> no, I agree. And, and with Larry's recent decisions, it's it's obvious to me that you either knew something ahead of time or you uh, you called the right shot. So I agree 100%. Going into kind of back to Tidewater and the, and the stadium development. So I know that no one loves the fact that we had to have the delays due to everything impacted from COVID plus uh, some additional constraints with on with the build itself. But uh, I don't think a lot of people, and, and we've tried to cover this, really understand the revitalization effort of Tidewater and, and on that site specifically, the, the fact that it was a brownfield site. Mm-hmm. And one of the most fascinating stories that I hope never loses its luster in the space is that, uh, one, the city had a tremendous effort in making sure that we accomplished getting that site remediated, which was a, sounded like a Herculean effort all in itself. But then in doing the rest of the investigations, it seems like your administration has also secured additional funding up to about $4 million um, from the EPA to make sure that all toxic sites within Pawtucket are being remediated or at least undergoing some level of cleanup and treatment now. Now, don't quote me. I don't know if my information no, is 100%. No, no, yep. But what, what, is, what is the kind of the over-under uh, level of effort from your administration, and what does that rest of that work look like inside the space for so the city? I th- the, the administration and the folks in the planning department and, and the commerce department, of, they have great teams. So they're aggressive on trying to get as much state and federal dollars as we can into the community. And the team we have now is exceptional. I've always had a great been fortunate. I talked about a team. It's, you know put the right people around you. And so I've been very fortunate on that. So, and we've invested, but in all fairness to the Tidewater site, um, there was a, I say, tragic issue where there was a mercury spill there, kids had broken into, they had illegal mercury, they being the national grid at the time, now it's Rhode Island Energy. Um, They had some mercury that was on the site and the kids broke in and threw it out, so it raised the issue of the contamination. Having said that though, National Grid, now Rhode Island Energy, had done the right thing. So they partnered with us. They realized, hey, we messed up. We have obligations. We worked hand in hand with them at the beginning to get that property clean. And timing is everything. We were looking at that as potentially a property as what would be, you know, you're after a brownfield site, how do you get it clean and what's the reuse? Well, the soccer stadium was a, a, a less expensive reuse than maybe building uh, property on there, you know, bu- right. digging down the residential and stuff. But also, residential would have given us quick cash, but wouldn't have given us the access of the waterfront, right? You have now a clean area. You're able to, you'll be able to walk down there on a, a, you know, whether you call it a bike pack, a walking pack. You know, we have the vision, how it ties to our state pier, and maybe the boats are coming in. So, but having said that, you know, there's been a partnership. Yes, we as administration had to go out and raise those dollars, find those dollars in a lot of ways. And again, to the credit to the teams, um, but now it's implementing it and working in partnership. So we're very, very lucky. With the uh, rest of the industrial areas that are being remediated right now, do you have an official timeline of when we can, quote unquote, be toxic free and clean from those those EPA efforts? You know, I, so the stuff we're working on, we're working very closely. So I would say in the next five years, but I don't know, you know, we still have other mill buildings that were utilized. So I want to be very careful. I don't know that we'll... We're going to be toxic free because of other things. But the stuff we're working on uh, with, especially at this site and some of the other sites, it would be within the five years. So, I mean, still, that's a huge, that's a huge victory considering the amount of industrial output and capacity that this city is known for. So my hat's off to you for that one. Beyond professional soccer coming to Pawtucket uh, by 2025, you know, allegedly we're, we're looking at the stadium being potentially completed by the end of next year so that it's prepared uh, what are some things, uh, whether it's be, it would be future projects or enhancements that citizens might be able to look forward to on the horizon in 2024? Yeah, um, so right now we're seeing a big increase um, in rehab, rehabilitation of our mill building, especially around the commuter rail. Um, one of, we have two, um, I'll say, major projects. Um, one is probably uh, north of 40 and the other is probably north of, um, of 70 on each side of the railroad and and we we're, they're going through the process you know financial uh the zoning and code enforcement so we have two vacant sites right now that are down to the ground one was the old roberts chemical which is right against our commuter rail um, that we have somebody that bought that land and is looking at building a retail mixed use and residential um, uh, we have another on the broad street I'm sorry, Dexter Street side, 
um, where the, we call it the old toppies in Pataki, right, where the meat market was, right? Everything's referred to back. Um, and so uh, the Paisa project, you know, we should see they've broken ground. They hit a lot of the issues as well through the supply chain, through the financial with the uh, interest rates. So, but we should be seeing uh, ground being dug and stuff coming up out of the ground. Um, you know, so that's exciting. There's a lot of affordable housing units here and there. We have uh, Pawtucket Central Falls um, uh, Housing Authority, not Housing Authority, but uh, PCFD, and they're investing in um, affordable housing, and we're working partners with them. So there's a lot of those good things that are happening. But the most active zo site would be the downtown um, area that connects to the Tidewater, and we also have our um, millions of square feet in our cone and thread district, which is on the other side of the river, I'm, I'm sorry, of the, the train station. And so, uh, you know, they just, unfortunately, the owner just passed away. So they're going through the changeover and the trustees of that property, but that has a lot of potential. So, you know, but all it ties around to, it's all gonna be around soccer, you know, the stadium and the open access and the commuter rail is where we're seeing our most act activity. In terms of participation in the games, do you think listeners can expect to see you at a couple of Bryant University games? Yeah, awesome. absolutely, right? I, I know I'm going to, you know, Bryant University, you know, remember, I'm born and raised in Rhode Island. I'm going to have to pack a lunch and I might have to get a hotel room. But yes, <laughs> they will see me up there. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, you don't have someone drive you for those moments? Oh, no, no, I don't have a driver. So it's, <laughs> you know, my wife will tell you that I probably should use a driver because of the way I drive, but we don't have a driver. <laughs> This project is one of the largest investments in the state, in the city, uh, in a very long time. In fact, I, I couldn't find many projects that weren't multiple sites that had greater uh, dollars invested. When you look at that, what's, what's the one thing that you would want to communicate as a message to anyone in the state about the importance of, of getting this right and making sure that Tidewater Landing is a successful experience. You know, one of the realities that we all do is it's all based on, we base everything on dollars, right? It really is impact. And that was one of, the, and, but it's not tangible, right? People can measure for dollars. So you think about the hundreds of thousands of dollars, millions of dollars being invested in the city of Pawtucket. Again, waterfront access, you've heard me say this, public access uh, to areas that they haven't had, right? We'll have boat rides. We're also investing Further down the road, we bought some about 9.2 acres to open to do open space, but but just specifically on this property, you know, it's going to be the entrance point. You're coming in from Massachusetts. You're going to see this development. You're going to see this. So there's a lot of messaging, right? It's impact to the community. It's how people measure if they want to come into Rhode Island and into the into the city to to do business. Um, and so there's a lot a lot of different impacts. There's a really emotional impact. Uh, to the community. Um, you know, while we're all a great, com you know, people are wonderful, they get along and they're a tight knit community, but there's something now to be proud of. We're proud of everything we do and we're proud of our families and the multiple cultures. And But, but now you're going to have people coming actively into your community and you're going to see it growing and that passion. And, you know, there's a lot of passion as, you know, I mentioned to you earlier, I, I play pretend to know, but there's a lot of passion and emotion with the soccer folks that love soccer. So there's there's a lot of different impacts, you know, it's even though we measure it by finance. Again to your to your melting pot comment earlier, I can't think of a more diverse city in the state. And I think there couldn't have been a better selection in terms of site choice, not just in the river, but just in terms of a community that really reflects and adopts that that soccer minded culture. So Mayor, I can't thank you enough for joining us here at Raising Anchor today. Uh, we can't wait to see the great things in store for 2024, and I hope we get to do a check-in maybe next year and Anytime. see how the city is working through those those kind of final logistics as we get ready for Tidewater. Appreciate it. Thank you for your time. We're excited about it, too. Um, and again, we're looking forward to not only the football club coming in and playing, but the football coming in in 2025 playing in Pawtucket. Agreed. <laughs> is, there any, uh, is there anything you'd like to share for how citizens can best engage with your office or get, get provided updates? Listen, no, anytime, you know, we, go, we have the emails, we have our website, and you go right on the website, it'll take you over to that. You know, we do our best, but, you know, we're government. So as much as we say we want to mock it, that's probably with the lowest uh, amount of budgeted. Uh, but no, anytime people have comments, concerns, they want to share it, there's always social media, um, emails. And then for those that are old school like myself, you can always pick up the phone. <laughs> <laughs>
You can find us on Twitter, Threads, and TikTok at RIFC Podcast. You can find us on Instagram at Raising Anchor. And, of course, you can visit us at www.RaisingAnchorPodcast.com. Mayor, again, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Matt. Appreciate it. Where's the key to the city? And is there just one key that you give out to people? Or do you keep multiple copies of it for your ceremonies? Where's that key? <laughs> Why, you want one? I mean, I, I just, you know. <laughs> we'll get you one. But I, no, right? The multiple <laughs> keys, they're designed. Um, and what it does is it gets you five minutes to talk with the mayor. That's about the value. That's I didn't it. even get a key and I got, <laughs> I got an hour. That's fantastic.